morning. <laughs> Almost said good afternoon. Welcome to the April edition of the National Training and Simulation Association and Central Florida Tech Grove Connect. For those of you that haven't joined us in the past, we are doing these webinars each month for seven months, highlighting the story and the people and the innovation behind the best papers and the best tutorial from ITSIC the previous year. So these, this year, obviously, we're focusing on ITSIC 2021, and we'll look forward to doing this again in 2022. And who knows, maybe some of you that are with us today are submitting papers and will be our guest on this webinar. But today, we're very excited to have the best paper from the Emerging Concepts Committee. It is a really interesting novel algorithm that, frankly, this is one of those that I'm fascinated by it, and, but Matthew is going to help us really understand it along with Jeremy and Rodney who are going to help put it in context as well. So we're glad that all of you are with us. So I would like each of our participants today to briefly tell you who they are, the organization they're with, and their role in that organization. I'm going to start with you, Matthew, as the author of the paper and the chief scientist, chief engineer from the Fires Battle Lab. All right, so I am Matthew McLaughlin. I am a lead computer scientist at the Fires Battle Lab in Fort Sill. I have a master's in engineering and modeling and simulations from Arizona State University. And my interest in optimization started in my undergrad with my physics professor telling me about Newton's method beyond just one independent variable. When I started working for the Army, I learned that I, I learned the way things were done in field artillery, and I always questioned whether that was the best way or the best teachable way. And if computers have a permanent place in the battle space, why not exploit all that computing power? Excellent. Dr. Jeremy Lamb joining us today as well. Hi, good morning. Um, comms check, you can hear me still, right? Yes, sir. <laughs> Just making sure. Uh, yes, uh, I'm Jeremy Landman. I'm the Chief Technology Officer for the U.S. Army Program Executive Office for Simulation Training and Instrumentation down in Orlando, Florida. Um, for those that don't know, PO Stry is the, the Army's premier uh, simulation training and test and training capability to soldiers. Um, we do everything from live virtual constructive gaming across uh, mission programs, uh, foreign military cells, and working with our allied partners in simulation and training, uh, as well as <clears throat> uh, threat system testing, uh, instrumentation management, uh, and cyber operations. So we have a very vast and large portfolio. Uh, we're a $2.4 billion uh, a year organization um, with about 1,200, uh, I would say, DAC employees in, in Orlando and several contractors and military uh, officers as well. And, um, you know, we, we have a, a, a we, we reach out to everything. So if you've ever been an Army soldier, you've probably touched a STRI training asset at some point in your Army career, whether at the combat training centers, at your home stations, um, or uh, even in the ranges, if you've done gunnery qualification or small, you, you've touched a STRI asset. So, um, you know, we, we, we are going through this uh, massive, modernization um, aspect where the uh, the army uh, leadership has said we got to get past kind of the old laser tag mile systems that you all know and love <laughs> that have been around for 50 years and let, let's start getting into the future of what today's 18 year old soldiers want to see you know because they you know they're very technically savvy they can build their own apps and games and everything so how do we put that power into their hands so that they can you know, build the, the best um, training and simulation gaming technologies to improve their user experience. So, um, you know, a little bit of a paradigm shift on how we do things, trying to be more efficient, uh, optimize, as we'll talk about today, you know, how do we, you know, optimize some of our processes, our simulations, our how we plan, prepare, execute, assess, um, you know, our, our, throughout the whole training spectrum for, for our soldiers. And, you know, in that continuous improvement. So AI, machine learning, deep learning is a, a very critical 
technology area that we've, I would say, not done a lot with really in the old gaming and simulation world. Everything's been pretty deterministic, you know, so going to a more organized, stochastic way of, uh, you know, training is a, a different of a paradigm shift for soldier training with respect to, you know, making sure we man, you know, work to doctrine and, and, and those areas. So um, definitely a, a lot of cool and interesting um, things going on in the Army with respect to where we're modernizing both in simulation, uh, gaming, cyber operations, and uh, test and training operations. So uh, definitely look forward to the discussion today. And uh, I think uh, uh, it hopefully we'll give some insight for um, academia and vendors and, and small and other government agencies that may be interested in working with us in the future on how do we make this better for our soldiers. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. Rodney Lusher. Rodney's joining us also from the Fires Battle Lab. And I just learned this morning he's a UCF, University of Central Florida Knight, one of our own alumni. So Rodney, welcome this morning. Yeah. Uh, so I'm Rod Lusher, and I work here at Fort Sill. I am no longer in the Battle Lab, but uh, two years ago, I was in the same office as Matt McLaughlin. But I'm a career field artillery officer. So uh, teaming up with, with Matt sort of worked well, I think, for both of us. Uh, he could teach me a lot about what could be done with automation, and I could teach him a little bit about what was done in the field artillery. And we put our heads together and uh, came up with a good idea. I left about two years ago, and Matt continued the work and has taken it in a new and very exciting direction. Uh, so I'm still glad to be connected to that because I think he's doing some things that will really be a significant advancement for us. Uh, I now work in the fire support test directorate. So, you know, he's kind of on the front end of building things, uh, building army things. And I'm on the back end of it where I'm now in a world where I test uh, the field artillery devices that have been built and the software uh, that goes with it. We test that stuff. So uh, still very connected to him. He only works about a mile from me now. Um, so it's been a, a good partnership. Over. Excellent. Thank you. Matthew, let's come back to you because you are the uh, the brains behind all this, uh, along with Rodney. But one of the things we want to talk about in this webinar is really the journey that led to this innovation, the problem that you identified, the thought process you went through to come up with a really novel approach, and the evolution of developing that algorithm as well as some hurdles that you had to overcome to do this. So tell us a little bit about that journey behind this. Okay, so it, I, I did have a journey. It's, it's got a backstory to it. This uh, project started sort of as a side project to a, it's a paper I wrote in 2019. Uh, and, and in that paper, I looked at some fire sim code and pulled out some munition and effects models. I wrote out a long mathematical equation uh, for the percentage of target area destroyed. And it was a messy integral with several layers of nested integrals. Simplified the equation out and obtained a much simpler mathematical model that would predict the effectiveness of rounds against a target uh, given a set of aim points. And so this was the use case that I used in my uh, paper last year. Um, uh, so I, I, I manipulated that math model even further by discretizing the sample points into a grid, putting boundaries uh, against the bell curve tails and intersecting these boundaries with the target area so it would run as efficiently as possible on computers. Then I took that model and I put it in an open source optimizer called GSL. Uh, the optimizer would move around main points around in order to maximize the lethal area or effectiveness of the endpoint solution. Now I know that from using optimizers, there are parameters that need to be set that are separate from my other inputs. These factors do not have a mathematical role in the objective function, but are important for the algorithms in solving the problem. Uh, for example, the number of iterations and repetitions, the convergence threshold, 
the step size, the convergence algorithm. None of these have any meaning to the end user, but need to be set. Anyways, as I developed that 2019 paper, I kept getting hounded while developing the software for that paper that the algorithm isn't worth anything unless it uh, can generate solutions fast. I had to optimize aim points during battle as fast as possible. This pressure created the requirement that I needed to pursue the 2021 paper uh, and best paper for the ESIT subcommittee uh, and the topic of our discussion. I considered if it was possible to optimize around these control factors, such as the number of iterations and repetitions, uh, convergence threshold step size and convergence algorithm, and how they change based on the situation. I wrote down some notes and stuffed them into my desk drawer and finished the 2019 paper and presented it. Well, in 2020, my wife was due to have our baby at the same time ITSIC 2020 would be, so I continued to mentally develop the concept but not actually work on it. Uh, I submitted the abstract again in 2021 and began expanding it. That's when it really started to take off. Uh, it was not really work related, so I had to spend as few hours on it as I could. I would run the software as I left work and return the next day to see what I didn't configure right. Uh, I did this, I, I did research on this topic and found lots of related works, but nothing seemed to address the speed of relevance. Uh, meta optimization focused on making optimizations faster but I couldn't find anything that balanced good enough solutions now or better solutions later. Um, I know that the, a, a lot of academic or business applications for optimizing, including machine learning, are, are, are part of larger projects and that deadlines are more or less arbitrary. These organizations can solve problems with inefficiencies by just throwing more computing power at it. However, in military applications, the, the moment of action has passed. And good enough solutions now could mean the difference between life and death. The computing power is also limited, especially when the enemy is degrading your network. Uh, on the other hand, inefficiencies are gonna eat into the munition inventory and also the defense budget. I wanted to give that, that control to the commander with one dial, and train a tunable meta optimizer to avoid the intersection of low quality solutions and long processing time. I mentioned in the presentation, but I'll mention it here again, even this dial can be optimized out. If I have a moving target and I dead reckon uncertainty and its velocity over time, uh, its target location error quickly degrades. A solution is needed more immediately uh, to get effects on it. However, a stationary target can afford a longer time on target. So I can find, I can uh, find where, so I can, so in order to optimize out that dial, I can find uh, where solution quality at time equals zero intersects the degradation of the solution to obtain an optimal deadline. Now, anyways, for anyone who's, unfamiliar with the process I explained at ITSIC, I created a meta model for the software I'm trying to optimize. In my use case, this was the aim point solution generator. This meta model would predict processing time and solution quality so that the processing time is not realized when I train the meta optimizer. You could train the meta optimizer with the real software but it would take a lot longer as it must wait that amount of processing time to obtain a, obtain a score. And it also is, it would also introduce a lot of randomness, which will affect the speed in which it can train. So with this meta model, uh, it's trained using supervised learning. Uh, once it accurately predicts how long the software takes given a collection of inputs and control variables, I use it to train the meta optimizer. 
It plays with the meta model in a reinforcement or transfer learning environment to exploit the control configurations given a set of inputs. It becomes a tunable meta optimizer if I also score it compared to the dial uh, that I give the user control over. If the dial represents a deadline, failing to meet the deadline punishes the untrained meta optimizer model. Given this concept, that's, that's all I got to say about my military centric use case. This is a very general solution and could be applied to other use cases and applications, all of which fall outside of my job description, but I think it could be really useful in any short term planning, such as manufacturing, logistics, or forecasting. I don't, I don't see why I can't why it can't be used to improve the performance of neural network training, or even in some stretch, uh, human training, as long as you can create a meta model for the human. It could expand to other resources, not just processing time. The meta model could also be a simulation and inputs could be the, the mission and the controls parameters could be the courses of action. And it will optimize on the course of action given the mission. I feel like there's a lot of unexplored potential, but I'll need help from the community to bring it forward. Wow, thank you so much. So Rodney, with have you in your role with testing and evaluating, has have you embedded this algorithm and tested or evaluated it to the extent? Are we at that point? I don't think we're at that point yet. What uh, what Matthew is doing is responding um, to the calls from the, we call it our requirements community. What do we need to, uh, to go to war with a competitor in the future? And this is a great area of competition right now um, who can deliver these, in this case, lethal effects faster, better, and, uh, and there's, they're looking for efficiencies and integration of modern technology. So it's a great competition. And that's where we got this idea to begin with. Um, and so that was the first part of Matthew's discussion about what we did before and in arranging aim points and optimal patterns that would wrap around a mountain or would follow a road, or perhaps you could even take out just specific blocks in a city Mm -hmm. And it would a save ammunition and B it would minimize collateral damage. So that was sort of where this thing began. And uh, it's, we don't have anything like that currently. And what he's done in the last year is taking that to a more general case uh, where that could be exported to other applications. Uh, mm -hmm. But it did have a very strict military beginning, but uh, he's been able to expand it to something um, much more broad but the answer to it is no we don't have that in testing yet because we don't yet have it in our capabilities and uh and so that's sort of uh where we're standing today okay so jeremy given that conversation what are your thoughts on the potential impact of this because i mean to hear a comment like this could save money prevent collateral damage you know reduce budget save munitions, we don't have anything like this. I mean, all of that's like, wow. Right, yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree um, with Rodney and Matthew on this. So, you know, that, that that's the, the whole point of stimulation and training is to try to prepare soldiers, reduce risk, you know, get them ready, uh, make uh, it, it more cost effective, um, especially, you know, with, with you know, we, we have digital training versus live training, right? You know, live fire versus kind of the uh, you know digital range, where the, even in the training realm, you know, we, we got to look to save money on you know, munitions used, and you know, there's also environmental effects and there's safety concerns. I mean, there's all those things that even in the training world that that we have to prepare um, and, and consider when we're developing um, our solutions and working with our capabilities developers to ensure things like this get incorporated into those um, training solutions. So, you know, and it is just it, it kind of speaking specific to, you know, the, the, the live fire kind of uh, paradigm or use case here. I mean, we do 
you know, small arms, uh, you know, uh, type live fire training up to tank gunnery qualification that are, that's all live fire at, uh, at the various army ranges uh, for soldiers to qualify. Um, and then the master gunner is there to ensure, you know, things are going well, but a lot of that is still relatively manual. There's not a lot of um, optimization applied. You know, there's, there's not a lot of AI machine learning applied. It's really, you know, here's your system to collect the data. Uh, and then it's, it's kind of the master gunner really out there or, or the trainer out there um, facilitating everything. So what we want to do is put the right tools in the hands of that trainer to be able to, as Matthew stated, it, it dial that, you know, what's really important to them at that moment with that unit or that soldier. You know, really, how do you uh, really um, customize that experience for that soldier so they can make those decisions based on, how they feel because we want to give that power to those trainers to, and, and the commanders to make the decisions on what's really important um you know the cost you know depending on the environment the the scenario and everything so um definitely critical and you know and we, we've been at po stride we've been experimenting with some science and technology type projects to do some of that very early uh, AI machine learning, nothing with optimization that Matthew's talking, that's a different level or layer that you, you apply on top of, I think, um, some of the new AI machine learning technologies that are coming out. Um, and just beyond live fire, you know, th this particular use case, but talking about the general use case, I mean, logistics, um, inventory supplies and managing all that, um, structuring uh, data, you know, because we, we have to integrate with multiple authoritative data sets and how do you optimize that networks, um, you know, being able to tune networks based on your scenario, you know, it, a, a combat training center needs a massive network for thousands of players, whereas maybe just a small platoon or squad at a home station doesn't. So being able to, you know, I, I would say dynamically tune or optimize the networks so that you know they, they get the data they need from the various sources and, and, and different network protocols that we have to run for the training networks as well as you know integrating with mission command and all the other um, capabilities so um from that perspective there's a there's a great deal of applicability uh, which is why you know when this came through the you know i'm on the ESIT subcommittee at itsic we saw this like yeah this is something that the army is very interested obviously our capability managers are interested in it our users at the at Fort Sill and, and others are interested. Um, and when they're interested then the material providers, <laughs> of course, extremely interested. So, um, you know, we're, we're tracking this, of course, you know, to, to bring in as a potential um, capability within our, you know, again, not, we're not fielding anything on this yet, but getting it into the, the science technology um, aspect so that we could start integrating with our synthetic training environment which is the army's mm -hmm. premier modernization effort to bring live virtual constructive together mm -hmm. and um you know start to experiment more collect the data you know and validate performance and then we can start to transition that into programs of record so that it becomes institutionalized part of uh, the, the training product as well as to the as part of their you know their scenario development when they're building their exercises for the rotations um, everything, you know, again, from individual soldier up to um, battalion brigade of, you know, type of training scenarios. So um, definitely very interesting. Carolyn, so yes. may, may I jump in that? Because uh, Jeremy made several great points mm -hmm. and they really boil down to this and it is complexity. So, um, you know, I've got a, a saying that with great capability, comes great complexity. So the systems that we are building today are becoming more and more and more capable, but they're also becoming more and more complex. And you can take your own cell phone and you just look at how much of your cell phone do you really use and how much is it capable of? So um, we're having that same thing with the systems that we built and then the systems of systems that we put together only expands the, the complexity. So what I think you see Matthew working on here is how do we leverage automation to assist humans to deal with this kind of capability, this kind of complexity, but do it in a time sensitive manner. What he, Matthew made a great point about, you know, in the military applications, you have a very small window of opportunity before the enemy rearranges itself. You know, if you take gridlock on on um, on the streets of New York, 
You know, it, it's that way for a little while. And then, you know, something breaks and something moves. So, so, you know, the merging of that capability, complexity, and then this automation to assist humans, uh, I really think that's the area he's getting into. And, you know, I think this complexity thing applies to many, many different areas of uh, today's society. Over. Completely agree. I'm thinking, Matthew mentioned manufacturing. I'm thinking healthcare, just business processes, or uh, my, my goodness, it just goes on and on. But Matthew, I wanted to ask you, you worked on this during the pandemic, basically. So uh, how did you, did you get end user data? How, where did you get the training data that maybe you used as you were working on this algorithm? Did you have any end users that you actually talked to about the value that this might have or the impact it might have? Well, I mentally developed the concept during the pandemic, but I didn't start working on it until I was uh, back at the office. Mm -hmm. and, and the training data that I used to build the meta model, uh, I, I didn't need any any other people or existing training data. I created a design of experiments and ran it around uh, the, my use case, mm -hmm. uh, giving it all the uh, input configurations and control configurations and gathered data collecting its processing time and quality mm -hmm. of solutions. And that's the data that I used to train the meta model. Mm -hmm. We do have a question from Mike Miller, who's uh, on the webinar with us today. Can the meta model algorithms you've developed be applied to training solutions for networked distributed platforms? Well, the point of the meta model is so that it will operate as fast as possible when I'm training the, the meta optimizer model. Uh, so if you can model the if you can create a, a if you can gather data from your networked uh, systems which will uh, realize all the processing time uh, you will be able to extract the meta model that will represent a more aggregate model and use that in training the meta optimizer so yeah, yeah my, the software i was wrapping around there were some configurations that it realized a lot of processing time. Takes several minutes. Uh, some took hours. Uh, I tried to mm -hmm. avoid those configurations because that will op not really ever optimally be selected in the in, in the mm -hmm. end. But uh, it it's that first part of this training that it uh, the, the meta model that is m more time costly. Yeah. Um. We also have a question, uh, Jack, who's on the webinar with us. Can this be used by or for logistics? That's Jeremy, you mentioned the application to logistics. I know Stry, I'm sure you work on training solutions for logistics. Matthew, you mentioned that too. So Any of I I, I, I believe so. Uh, it's not a use case that I have explored, but in the most general case, so I've mentioned applications in manufacturing, logistics, and forecasting. Uh, anything with dynamic initial conditions and and little time to wait for solutions. The cons the constraint is that the algorithm parameters need to be accessible and configurable. Uh, as a software programmer, we've been told never to hard code numbers, but make them everything configurable. So oftentimes we make them configurable, but only to uh, the software development team. So, and, and once that code compiles, all those numbers become hard coded. In other software applications like MATLAB and R, everything that feeds the algorithm is given to the user. So I can select things like back propagation algorithm. And software developers for these types of application should build this type of model, this uh, 
this meta optimization model into their software development pipeline. Uh, that was actually a big section of my paper before I Im imposed the ITSIC page limit. Uh, and so I had to cut the, my section on software development pipeline. But any software that exposes algorithmic parameters, this could wrap around so that it makes that software behave more optimally. And so, yeah, there's logistics algorithms, uh, manufacturing algorithms. I took a class during my master's uh, on manufacturing and learned uh, mm -hmm. about all that engineering and, and algorithms and heuristic models. But I see this with a, a lot of applications anywhere. Transportation comes to mind, all sorts of things. I'm curious yeah. from your presentation at ITSIC and the publishing of the paper at ITSIC, did you have some interesting conversations that uh, from those that saw the paper, saw your presentation, any potential collaborators or input? Well, I found that uh, I turned a lot of people off by showing all the mathematics during my presentation. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so in hindsight, I would uh, try to keep it a little less technical and a little more high level. Uh, Talk more about the actual use case scenarios, perhaps uh, yeah. next time you give a paper next presentation, time. correct? Yeah. Yes. The, um, the, the progress that you continue to make on this, are you continuing to do this kind of on your own time after hours still, or is this now an official task that's on your work <laughs> workload? <laughs> It's not. I have not made a lot of progress, and I've 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 recognized some additional guidelines to to mm -hmm. like the cost function, and, mm -hmm. and I would like to explore them. Uh, mm -hmm. But as Rodney can attest to, I've created more work for myself and other research avenues. Mm -hmm. um, so this is a where I think I'd like to talk a little bit about how anyone that's on the webinar today or that watches this recording afterwards, if they were interested in collaborating with the lab to help move this forward, whether it's through a CRADA, I don't I haven't asked you if there's any intellectual property filed yet around this, that it might be licensed out no. to someone who wanted to continue to develop it. So it sounds like the initial step would be some collaboration for continued joint development. Is that something you're interested in? And if so, how would someone go about initiating that? So this paper is mostly over the concept and I kind of lay everything out. Mm -hmm. uh, that Aimpoint Optimizer software from 2019, that would be more restrictive because that was a, a big software project. But mm -hmm. I, I this paper, everything's everything that I know is kind of in that paper and it can be mm -hmm. adapted into any other use case. It's got supervised learning and reinforcement learning and there's modules for that mm -hmm. and other mm -hmm. software products that you could take it in a slightly different avenue than I did, uh, but mm -hmm. everything's there. Uh, mm -hmm. But I'd like to I'd, I'd like to see this uh, become something in, in more practice, uh, especially on the software development pipeline, that mm -hmm. we develop our software so that it, out of the box, behaves more optimally. Mm -hmm. Not just making these configurable items that are tucked away and hidden from everybody. Right. That way we can open up our software and package and know it it's going to behave in the most op optimally it can. Jeremy, Rodney, let's, let's follow that thread a little bit, because as we all know, the pace of software development in the commercial world is pretty lightning speed, and it takes a little bit longer in the government world. Uh, and AI is 
still being explored and the early stages of being adopted, depending on the area of the national security community, I think. What would be some challenges or opportunities for someone that might be interested in further developing this to be able to test, embed it and test it somewhere? I'm sitting here in TechGrove where we have all these innovation cells, we have LVC docs, we have pilot training next stations, we have all sorts of platforms here that are available to be used for something like that once it gets to a certain point. But let's give our listeners a little bit of uh, insight about how that might work. Jeremy, if you want to tackle that. Yeah, um, I mean, in terms of uh, looking at how it would apply, to, especially in the you know military simulation, modeling simulation training, I mean, there, there's nothing stopping us from exploring that. I mean, from Obviously, for, for us at PO Stride, we have to have a requirement to build it as part of a solution, which, <clears throat> but, you know, that doesn't stop the, the, the science and technology and experimentation, which is where, like, things like Tech Grove and, um, you know, we have the SKI tech, Technology Integration Facility down in Orlando as well. Mm -hmm. um, so those are things where we, where we do as, uh, at PO Stride, work with our um, S&T communities, like the DEFCOMs for the Army mm -hmm. Research Labs, and so too. To, to explore these concepts and to assess the technology readiness level and to kind of figure out, you know, where could it apply? And then we would start looking at, we would then start communicating with our capability managers at TRADOC and the Army Futures Command. And then we would start to figure out where in that roadmap are we going to start applying that as part of a solution, you know, because we have to mature the technology readiness level of that. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, we want to get in early, right? We, in the old days, it was okay. What is kind of stuff that's ready to go that we can spend a couple of years maturing and get out? Now we're going back. We're going all the way to academic and theoretical research and starting there because we recognize that technology and, and these concepts are are essentially maturing overnight. I mean, it, it, you know, there as you mentioned, software development, all these concepts of AI machine learning, convolutional neural networks have come a long way in the last twenty years. I mean with, with um, hardware and computing process, computing resources are not an issue anymore like it used to be. I mean, cloud computing, everything has made that almost ubiquitous and that it's there. Now it's just how do you, like what Matthew's doing, optimize and improve these algorithms to be usable, right? To, to actually bring benefit to. So we wanna start looking at that, how that would work. For, for the Army and the synthetic training environment, this is prime time because as we're building the requirements of what that is going to look like, and as we're kind of going through this prototyping and I would say, uh, you know, soldier touch point type activity to, to, as we bring the enterprise together and all the data and all the scenario development, all the after action review capability and all everything that's coming into one environment, um, stuff like uh, these things are critical to be able to optimize all of those processes we want to automate everything the software development all the software pipelines the you know the <laughs> you know you, you, we talk about DevSecOps and digital engineering uh, this optimization stuff needs to be applied to those worlds so that we can incrementally and, and, and quickly and agile as the dod now tells us to do even though you know the acquisition process is still catching up with that but you know we want to get to that agile aspect of getting capability out and bringing in all kinds of vendors in to help do that so for us as, as was i think published last week um, the c platform development kit is now available for vendors to mm -hmm. yeah. request and that's where i think you can play with what we have existing for the c infrastructure and, and maybe kind of figure out you know where um, applying AI machine learning algorithms and then trying to use Matthew's concepts to optimize them in that environment might be interesting. And that's something we would want to explore potentially at Tech Grove and see what vendors have. And then we, that'll help us inform our requirement a little bit better as we're, at, when we get to points of, uh, you know, more, more mature products and, um, you know, establish our steep product line, if you will. So um, also intelligent tutoring, uh, you know, we're getting big into, uh, you know, helping the soldiers in terms of how to use the systems and as well as other users. So that area, we talk logistics and sustainment, um, just maintaining inventory, spare parts and things of all of our uh, uh, systems. I mean, because we're not just software, we're also hardware assets for Internet of Things, devices, edge devices, computing resources. And we 
we POS Drive manage everything. You know, we're the entire system lifecycle owner of everything that we field. So, you know, there, there's a lot of application, not just the software, but I think across, um, you know, the, the, the system lifecycle product line management of these things where, where we could improve and automate um, a lot of the uh, processes and, and timelines, <laughs> hopefully. Um, you know, we talked about network optimization, um, reducing time to build scenarios and, and um, applying to, uh, you know, the assessments and, and getting soldiers real time feedback on and, and custom feedback for them on their uh, training exercises versus giving them a tech, you know, we in it, today we give them a take home package on a DVD or CD that gets tossed into the corner somewhere. You know, what we really want is to be able to provide them real time feedback tie that training to their training records and, and, you know, and, you know, as part of the, their, as they go out through their career so that when they come back to any, whether it's a combat training center, home station, digital range or live fire range or wherever they're at, it, or even if they're deployed or if they're even on the uh, operational tactical system, like a, a tank or an aviation platform, like, you know, the, the Blackhawk or something, you know, we, we're going to have embedded training capabilities on those systems and, and we got to tie all that together. It's a hard problem. It's it, as um, Rodney said. It's extremely complex. It's getting more complex by the day. But things like what Matthew's doing can help us manage that complexity and make life hopefully easier. Not only for you know the combat and material developers, but also for the user, well, ultimately for the users and for vendors to understand how to play in this new world that we're dealing at, dealing with. Um, and, and we're looking for those innovative ideas from everyone. Um, not we're not solely looking at just traditional vendors or anything we're, we're no kidding you know what what are folks doing out there that we can bring on quickly assess and then potentially roadmap a strategic, you know, as we come up with our strategy we can potentially roadmap that into a capability or a feature mm -hmm. uh, in a future uh, mm -hmm. release or uh, product solution so all right over <laughs> as you mentioned earlier jeremy and your uh, very wonderful comments that that's a lot of the reason that TechGrow was established by the Naval Air Warfare Center Training Systems Division, PEO Stride, Air Force Agency for Modeling and Simulation, Marine Corps PM Traces, and now Army Futures Command Synthetic Training Environment is a member of TechGrow along with the uh, Army's uh, Simulation and Training Technology Center, and, Soldier and, Dev Center. Yeah, the Joint Artificial Intelligence and, Center. <laughs> Jake, uh, we have all these other entities that are in Orlando and part of Team Orlando and that we collaborate with, to your point, the uh, DOD Joint AI Center, who we're working with on a project that we're executing through TechGrove to do just exactly what you're talking about, and that is scan the, the universe out there to find these really early stage or even existing solutions that may be in other sectors altogether that are applicable to a need in training that would have some AI capabilities um, underlying it. So for those of you that are with us on the webinar today, there are lots of ways to connect in to this community. If you are not a member of some of the other transaction consortium, such as the joint AI Center, they, Tradewind is the name of their consortia. T-Rex, the Training and Readiness Accelerator, is uh, stood up by PEO Stry, actually, is, is a consortium for simulation and training needs. There's lots of other consortium out there tied to naval aviation and other things that would be happy to tell you more about. We'd love for you to connect to TechGrove, certainly. You can just go to our website, centralfloridatechgrove.org, fill out that contact us form and we'll get you in our network and share with us your capabilities and what you're looking for. Part of what we want to do is help connect you to innovators like Matthew, for example, because what he's doing needs collaborators to help move it forward so it could get to the point where it could be embedded in whether it's military applications or even other commercial applications. I'm really excited about some of the commercial applications as well. So I'm sitting here thinking about how do we get the word out beyond the, just the NTSA community even about this really novel opportunity. So there's further discussion around that. But, uh, any other 
just a reminder to those that are on the webinar, if you have some other questions or even just comments that you'd like to make, observations, be sure you put those in there. But Matthew, I would like to hear about your other work that you're doing there in the fire battle lab. You, well, this is not on your actual work responsibilities list. And a lot of things are. So tell us about, to the extent you can, some of the problems that you're working on solving today. Uh, so I, I, I work with, uh, like right now, I, I've got to focus on AI uh, in simulation. And so I, I, I like the idea of AI and machine learning solutions, but I think there are more strategic approaches that can be employed when, when the problem is decomposed. So for example, in a sensor to shooter pipeline, sensor fusion and correlation is a math problem. Weapon effectiveness uh, on a target is another math problem to determine the probability of kill. Uh, weapon target pairing is an NP complete optimization problem. Uh, and the only thing that are left that cannot be explained is an AI ML problem. So if I have this whole pipeline that's all mathematically driven, I can narrow the scope of AI to just explain what I can't explain. And so in this situation that uh, some kind of cost model in the in this pipeline uh, that that keeps you more conservative on the number of rounds, so you don't run out, or or assign target priorities is another AI, and you just uh, you can train those through a simulation. And I, Caroline, I could probably jump in there a little bit, a little bit higher level than than what Matthew did, and that is, you know, the battle labs exist to um, to see if if ideas will work so typically we have concepts that that precede experimentation and this concept is usually written in a white paper and somebody has an idea and it seems like it's got some merit so we want to explore it a little bit deeper and the experimentation community then takes that and runs experiments to find out whether or not this concept would work and if we find some value that the concept looks like it has merit and we put it into simulation and it had tested out and it did about what we thought it would do, then we can proceed to writing requirements where we're starting to get into now, here's something that we might want built or developed. So before that funding commitment is made, there is some, some experimentation that goes on to see if the idea truly has merit. Thank you for that lab. There, there's a process, right? <laughs> there, there are steps along the path to moving something like this forward, obviously. But I want to ask uh, if any of you have some thoughts on a question that was submitted by one of our attendees when they registered, and that is with all this movement toward embedding AI in lots of different scenarios, how do you simulate embedded AI in a simulated training scenario? I'm, I'm not, I can't quite wrap my head around the question, but if you're using AI to help improve and drive the simulation itself, how do you simulate the, the AI that may be in the software? So that's AI the in simulation, it depends on what, what you need. If it's AI is, if you're just looking for the effect of AI, then if you can configure your, your simulated system to Im have improved processing time or improved effectiveness against uh, a target, then I could just be modeling the effect of AI rather than AI itself inside the simulation. Mm -hmm. That makes um, sense. And Link, hopefully that addressed your question. If not, then uh, put some comments in the chat. Uh, there's some comments in the 
the chat about ROI of AI. And I, from what I've seen, really trying to get hands around that whole life cycle return on investment is not easy now. How does that get more complicated when you start going to these more complicated solutions, maybe with a lot of AI and machine learning? Or does that become easier, perhaps, with the AI embedded in there? Can the AI itself help calculate or define that ROI? I'm not sure my question even makes sense, but it's, it's rolling around in my head. <laughs> yeah, Carolina, I mean, uh, I can kind of give an example of where we kind of got some ROI from some early application of uh, machine learning. So um, a couple of probably 2016, 17 time frame, we had a, a, a S&T project. It was actually a SIBR, but it was an S&T project to apply, um, you know, convolutional neural network type stuff. It was actually um, uh, uh, region-based convolutional neural network for object detection on uh, our uh, gunnery, this was our digital range training system, which is a gunnery qualification uh, to, to qualify gunners <laughs> to shoot tanks. Mm -hmm. And what we were doing, what we do with, during those training, while they're being trained to, to do that, it's a live fire training exercise. We instrument the heck out of the tank and the soldier, and you know, there's video, there's audio, there's all kinds of things. So what we were, and what, what's, what's, what happens today is, to collect all that data and to prepare an after action review or a take home package is extremely manually intensive. It requires an analyst to sit and review all the video, all the audio, tag things. Um, and then, you know, they're, they're filling out tables and, you know, and essentially providing their scorecards. So what we were trying to do was apply some AI machine learning techniques to automate that whole process and use object detection algorithms to go and search through the video and tag things that, you know, you know targets and how they fired and listening to the audio using um mm -hmm. a variety of other algorithms i can't remember we had, we actually did an ITSIC paper it was i think 2018 on this um uh, and uh you know through all through all that processing trying to essentially not take the place of you know the trainer and the analyst but to help them and what, what we it was you know it it was early, but what we ended up showing was a lot of time reduced in them building that package. So, because they could quickly say, okay, these are just areas of video that I care about. I don't have to watch all two hours of it. You know, the, the, the algorithms kind of identified those areas that they could focus on. So instead of, you know, a day or two days of building the package, we got it down to half a day, you know, so that was getting it to the, to the unit or the trainees faster. Um, so there was the time savings um, and there's a cost savings as well, because you're, you know, you're, you're not taking as much time from the analyst. They can now do multiple other things um, and, and improve work. So there was the, we think there was some ROI or potential ROI that we, we see from, you know, having that process automated using this as a, as a way to move that forward. Now I kind of sense we haven't done much with it since because <laughs> COVID came in and it was hard to get, you know, but the other challenge was data. So, you know, training these algorithms in the past has been incredibly hard. I mean, you know, there's a lot of different convolutional neural networks out there. There's a lot of different algorithm implementations. You know, you, there's trade-offs between, you know, organized structure, you know, whether it's structured data or unstructured data, how well it's organized, how much you have. So you got to make a lot of design decisions and trying to, to, to train these algorithms can be difficult if you don't have the data available and um, you know, it, so, the, so there's a lot of learning that we're still trying to figure out on how we could do that, how to be more, I guess, optimized with how we collect that data, feed the, the learning algorithms um, so that, you know, they, they can continuously to evolve as they are fed more data. So, you know, those are an example, I think, where we saw potential for ROI um, from just that perspective. Now, looking at it from optimizing software processes and life cycle and liches. I mean, that's a whole new area we hadn't even scratched the surface on. And I do believe there could be ROI, but it would be pockets probably, you know, we'd have to explore certain places, crawl, walk, run it to kind of see it's not going to ever be a big bang. Every we're just going to automate everything all at once. But, um, you know, we look for those opportunistic areas to, to see where it makes sense. And, you know, the, the only way we're going to know is until we got to experiment, right? We got to get out there and, you know, play with these technologies and apply them and see what 
just kind of see what the art of the possible is there. Over. I lost my cursor there. Sorry. <laughs> anyway. Good. Uh, Jeremy, just uh, there, we have a few minutes left here. And Caroline, I lost some of you. All right. Don't touch anything there. You went on mute again. <laughs> mm -hmm. We hear you now. Okay. I'm really not touching anything. <laughs> it's AI. <laughs> I know. I tell you, it's it's a bit of a spooky world sometimes. I I, I tell you, so there. That's a whole nother conversation about all the the ethics and the the uh, psychological impact of AI, right? So that's for another day. In the few minutes that we have left, Jeremy, just from a PEO Stride perspective, and then Rodney, I want to ask you what are your top five big challenges maybe or uh, trends that you're really focusing on or your PEO Stride? Uh, with respect to AI machine learning or any anything. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'll do a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, obviously, you know, when I mentioned at the beginning, a synthetic training environment is our main modernization program. Um, as we collapse the, you know, the traditional live virtual constructive stove pipey domains into one, essentially, and I hate to use this term because it's so overly used and it's kind of cartoony, but it's the metaverse, right? It's the army metaverse. And, um, essentially having all of the you know, that one stop shop of, of all the army simulation training needs for soldiers so their their gaming their virtual experience uh and, and and as well as the live training which is interesting um bringing that into the fold and having everything be fully immersive augmented include augmented reality and extended reality um and um uh, and, and of course now the introduction of the cyber training uh, you know the, the, the ethical hacking and um defensive hacking and things like that that are coming in um so and, and as well as a variety of other information operations so for us you know looking at how you know we can do better with decision modeling and analysis uh automation obviously adaptive scenario generation for uh our, our, our exercises um, we want more autonomous simulated forces and agents within our gaming environment um, that are, you know, you know, like I said today, like you think of the traditional programs, they, they are more or less deterministic with rules engines, but maybe something more stochastic, but intelligent enough to, you know, it semantically understands, you know, the, mm -hmm. the, the training scenario and how soldiers are engaging uh, first with, with stimuli. Um, and then the sensor fusion problem, bringing in all that data, because that's just new data that's coming in that that's going to augment all of the, the traditional scenario and simulation data, as well as all the position location information and, and comms and video and everything else that goes on. Mm -hmm. Cybersecurity, absolutely will be, um, you know, how do we get to, I keep hearing continuous ATO, but I've never seen a good actual implementation of it. Is, is this going to help us get there? Because <laughs> I'm tired of fighting to get ATOs all the time. So if, if there's a way to do that, um, I'm, I'm all ears um, for, for across the, the simulation training spectrum for our, I'm sure others as well. Um, robotics and um, uh, trackless vehicles that we, we often, we actually feel today um, and, and be, make those smarter and more interesting. Um, I'm, we talked about after action review and the whole uh, training paradigm, data analytics and heuristics, um, you know, just doing better with our data. We do have a ton of data. We just don't know how to organize it and understand it if real quick. Like be able to, you know, no kidding, you know, what is our what is our data telling us? Training data, simulation right. data, all that. Mm -hmm. and, and there's just, you know, object detections, anomalies, blockchains, data record management, um, you know, aggregating data sets, uh, you know, network optimization. There's just so many things that I think this whole area applies to. 
and we just don't know what we don't know. It's like, okay, there's a lot of cool stuff. We see a lot of cool stuff, but how does it really apply to Army training? And it also applies to Navy, Marine Corps, and Air Force. I mean, they all we all do similar things. So whatever is being done in this world, I think applies to all of us. It's, but how do we figure that out? I think that's kind of the, our biggest challenge is from, from that perspective. I just see more and more opportunities for companies yeah. to engage in, in creatives to do some initial testing to access your data and but try run it through their solution depending and just see what the world of possibilities might be so uh, i know we're having more and more conversations with companies that are coming to tech grove and around those kind of cooperative development agreements as a really quick way to get started in collaborating and, and see where it might go so in the Two and a half minutes we have left. Rodney, Matthew, any last comments or words you'd like to share with our? Audience? Yeah, I'll I'll share with you a few things I think we're dealing with, and some of these I've already hit, and that is dealing with complexity. So if you have systems that are greatly capable, uh, it makes them also greatly complex. So how can we help users deal with that complexity so that they can take advantage of the capabilities? That's number one. Number two is in the business we're in, how do we win uh, the competition? We have threats out there that are moving things forward and we can't afford to get to showtime and and bring inferior capabilities. So the, uh, the military has done a great job emphasizing innovations. And I think that's what you see Matthew working now, coming up with innovations that give us that next step and doing a great job. Um, the other thing that challenges us is what technologies do we need? And this is my current job. What technologies do we need to test these capabilities that are coming down the road? A little bit of that is crystal ball. We've got to see the capability, but we sort of have to, to test it. We've got to be sort of working in parallel with development so that when it's, it's ready, you know, it's not a six or nine month delay that for us to get ready. So we've got to keep current. And the last thing I would say is, is, um, AI, what is that going to do to testing? So how do we isolate AI issues from human issues? And I think there's some work going on in, in being able to uh, classify uh, faults and anomalies into one, one camp mm -hmm. or the other. Over. Excellent insight. Thank you so much for both of you. And Matthew is the reason that we're all here on this webinar today, thanks to your innovative work. What uh, Final words would you like to share with our guest? Oh, uh, so to answer Rodney, AI can be used in testing. Uh, <laughs> AI, uh, and, and especially in a reinforcement learning environment, it's going to find ways to exploit. So it's going to identify problems probably even faster than a human in testing. So there is a lot of uh, AI in testing research done. Uh, I could point you to some of that. Uh, but other than that, yeah, I, I, I want to see this go somewhere. I know as an engineer, I've, I have found a problem, I solved the problem. And now I just, I, I, it's done. I put it in my desk and then nothing ever happens. Uh, and, get that across the threshold into the hands of somebody who can do something with it, right? Yes. I know that would be exciting for you. So hopefully somebody that's been with us today will want to have further conversations about that. Uh, and I thank you all for joining us. Our next NTSA Tech Grove Connect is actually going to be Wednesday, May 18th. So it's a little deviation from our normal schedule, but watch our LinkedIn page. If you're fill out that contact form on our website. Uh, we'll, you'll get the announcement directly about it. And that one's going to be about artificial intelligence and combat casualty care. We're looking, going to move into a medical world in our next one. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, hope all of you have a blessed Easter. Thank you. Thank you.